Hi, I'm Doug from Dynamic Computing and welcome to episode 103 of 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast. Now I have to apologize, the past two weeks I have not had a video out, not since my unboxing video of cool Amiga software. Work has gone absolutely insane over like that last eight or ten weeks. I don't know what happened. I'm just busy just all day long. And, uh, you know, a guy's got to work a real full-time job in order to pay for all these cool Amiga goodies. So, c'est la vie. Now, I generally use real Amiga hardware in all of my shows. Um, and I do it for a reason. Commodore built some really great machines. I mean, when your computer's from, you know, 1985 or your Commodore 64's from 1982 are still working perfectly to this day, they must have done something, right? I really love the feel of the old hardware. I really love pushing the, the old hardware to the limits and see what we can get it to do today. Now, you guys know I own a Vampire and my Amiga 500 in my Checkmate case. I've got an Amiga 1000 with a Vampire. You can maybe see it there. No, not quite. Um, I've got fantastic Amiga 4000 with a zippity doo dah day 68060 chip in it, a couple of Amiga 2000s with 030 and 040 chips, and a, an Amiga 1200 with an 040 chip. I love using my real Amigas, and I use them as much as possible in my shows. There is nothing that will convince me that using a real Amiga is not superior to any kind of emulation. It just is. That being said, I have zero issues with emulation. It's awesome. If you can't get an Amiga, you don't have room for an Amiga, you don't want to pay the outrageous prices for an Amiga, emulation is fantastic. Whether it's Amiga Forever that I, I reviewed a couple weeks ago for the new version, or one of the Linux machines, or a Mister, or, or anything like that, it's so nice and easy and, and powerful to be able to emulate almost any Amiga we want to. It's, it's just fantastic. That being said, I want to talk about a really cool piece of equipment that can be used to emulate an Amiga, and that is the Raspberry Pi 400. Let me show you a little bit about it. Now, most of us have heard of the Raspberry Pi in one form or another. Um, I've got a Raspberry Pi. This is a 3B, nice little computer right here that I've used in the past to emulate a 1541 drive with my Commodore 8 bits. Works great. I did a video a few months ago about the great RGB to HDMI adapters. They use the Pi Zero, just like 20, 25 bucks for a little Pi Zero and it deinterlaces your display. Um, I just did a video a few weeks ago on the Pi Storm, which is an awesome add on for an Amiga 500 or Amiga 2000 that gives you a faster CPU, retargetable graphics, fast hard drive, and some other options, all for only $15. Just kidding, it's not really $15. Now, last year, the Pi guys came out with this awesome machine. This is the Raspberry Pi 400, and it is a wedge-shaped computer. Look at that, we've got some uh, USB ports in the back, we've got some HDMI ports, a GPI GPIO header for expansion, uh, Ethernet on here. This little thing has a 1.8 gigahertz ARM CPU, four gigs of RAM, uh, it has an SD slot, so you can use it like a hard drive. It's just an amazing, amazing piece of machinery. $100. You can get these for 100 bucks, including a mouse, including a 16 gig SD card, the power supply, everything you need to get started. The world has not had or made a wedge-shaped computer that's worth anything since the Amiga 1200 back in the mid 90s. So this is incredible. And the Pi guys even referenced the Amiga as kind of a, an influence on their, their designs in some of their documentation. Really a nice little piece of machinery. And what's so cool about it, besides it just being a cool little wedge-shaped machine like many of our Amigas? Well, the fact that it can run any version of Amiga OS from 1.0 up to 3.2 and uh, handle any processor from a 68,000 up to an 040, uh, 512 megabytes of RAM, a, gigab a gigabyte of RAM on your Amiga. The thing can emulate almost anything we could dream of. The software that I use to run it is 
Amy Berry. Now this is a variation, kind of a modification of FSUAE, which is available for Linux, uh, that's made by the, the, uh, the Amy Berry team. And I'll have a website right there. You can go and investigate it. These guys do a great job. Now they created Amy Berry to be optimized to run on ARM-based machines like the Raspberry Pi. They will also work on other ARM-based devices too. You can get uh, releases for several different ARM-based devices. And it's available in a couple of distributions. You can download it just Amy Berry on its own, which is what we're doing today. You can get it with um, RetroPie, which implements a bunch of retro operating systems and gaming systems all under one uh, platform on the Raspberry Pi. You can get it in RetroPie, Diet Pi, uh, uh, Amoebian, that's another one, and the awesome PyMiga that's currently being handled by our good friend Chris, Mr. Pajamas Edwards, uh, is also based on Amy Berry. This may bring up a question in your mind. Why is it that I'm concentrating on Amy Berry instead of the awesome Pymega that so many of us have heard about? Well, there's a reason for that. Pymega is a conglomeration of a ton of tools, utilities, and Amiga OS 3.9 that's just absolutely lovingly held together with duct tape and bailing wire, kind of to emulate what Amiga could have been if Commodore would have continued on. It's trying to cram so much in there to make it as modern as possible um, that it's not quite Amiga-ish anymore in some ways. When you look at it, you're like, it doesn't even look like an Amiga. The menus aren't Amiga. I love it. I love Pymega. I love what Chris is doing. I use it. I got a SD card with it on there. Boom, slide it in. Pymega all day long. But you can't reconfigure Pymega to emulate Amiga OS 1.3 or an Amiga with a 68,000 chip. It just it doesn't work. Uh, you can't run Amiga OS 1.0 for experimental purposes. It is what it is. But with an Amy Berry, you can customize it like WinUAE. It's 100% worth using, but if you want to customize your Amiga and really bring it back to how things were back in the day, then Amy Berry with a custom install is the way to go. Now I'm going to recommend getting a bigger SD card than the 16 gig one that ships with the $100 package. Uh, 25 bucks, get yourself a 128 gig or 256 gig SD card, easy to find. This is not going to be a tutorial on setting up the Linux side of things, but it is pretty easy to use. PyOS is a great OS. It's based on Debian Linux. And you can also use Ubuntu or any other Linux distribution. In a nutshell, just download the PyOS Imager, which I will have a link to right here, uh, on your Windows or your Mac machine. And, and this software allows you to format your SD card and then pick and choose which version of the Raspberry Pi OS or other distribution you want to load on the SD card. It's really very easy and very straightforward. Once the image is created, you'll have a bootable Pi OS image. Stick that little guy in your beautiful little Pi 400 here, and you'll quickly boot up into a reasonable GUI. To be honest, I've never been a huge fan of the Linux GUIs. Uh, you know, they're they're okay, but they it seems like whenever you really need to get any real work done, you got to launch the terminal and do everything manually. Um, and they just they just aren't intuitive like maybe Windows and <coughs> Mac OS are. It's just not quite as intuitive. It is functional and it has a decent Chromium based browser built right in. So when you're not using your Pi 400 as an Amiga, you can use it as a great little web browser. Let's get mine booted up into the Pi OS and just take a quick look at it. So we've booted into the Pi OS here. And again, you can see it's a nice little GUI. It does the job. I mean, it's, it's uh, nothing to write home about, but it's perfectly functional. First thing you're going to want to do, of course, is join your own Wi-Fi network. So you get your little uh, Raspberry Pi on the network. And uh, we're going to launch Chromium, which I've got open right here. 
and we go to the Amy Berry website, which I'll list right down here. Now, this is going to have some details about Amy Berry, including uh, who's involved with the program and very importantly, how to make donations to the program to support their hard work. That's awesome. Now, we can go directly to the releases page, which I'll also have listed right down here. And this will give you the very, very latest release of Amy Berry for your Pi 400. Now, as of mid-July, they're up to version 4.1.4 when you go to the download page. And you'll notice a couple of versions here. Here's uh, uh, RP1 DMX, RP1 SDL2, RP1, RP2. Yeah, Basically, you're looking for the Raspberry Pi 4 version, which is going to be RPI 4. And you're looking for the DMX or Display Manx version, which is optimized for the Raspberry Pi. If you're using another uh, Linux piece of hardware, you can use the SDL2 and that will use a little different uh, way it addresses the graphics. This is important because it's not really clearly spelled out in the instructions which version you need. You kind of have to dig around for it. Now, there are a few requirements that you will need to download from your uh, your Pi here. And if we go to the, uh, the GitHub page, it's got an area called requirements here, which is going to list the different things that you need to download. We're really only interested in this in this uh, top part right here uh, where we grab a few particularly important files. Most of the stuff on this page we're not going to be interested in. Uh, it's only if you want to compile your own version of uh, Amy Berry on here and most of this we're never going to bother with. We're just going to download the actual version on the releases page. Da -da 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 -da. There we go. And you just download it like you download anything else. Once you've downloaded it, just go to your file browser to your downloads folder and you'll see you've got your your Amy Berry here. I've got a couple different versions that I've been playing with and you can just right click it and extract just like you would on a Windows based machine. And then you're going to get a nice folder called uh, Amy Berry RPI 4 DMX 32 bit. You can rename that if you want to. Now inside of here, we would just launch the Amy Berry program and Amy Berry would come right up on the screen. Now, of course, just like when we're dealing with uh, WinUAE on our Windows machines, this doesn't come with a ROM or the operating system. Those are still new items that are sold and available, so you cannot distribute those. You just need to bring your own ROMs and operating system. If you want to stick with Amiga OS 3.1 or below, Amiga Forever that I reviewed a couple of weeks ago is a great choice. It's got all the ROMs and everything and operating systems that you need. If you want to go with something new, you can go with a new Amiga OS 3.2, which is available from awesome vendors like Retro Rewind here in North America. Now they're in Canada, but they ship worldwide. If you're in Europe, Take a look at somebody like uh, Retro Passion. They do a fantastic job. They can create physical ROMs for if you want, but all you need is the CD that includes all the ROMs and the Amiga OS 3.2 discs that you need to get set up. So obviously the Pi 400 does not have a CD-ROM. Sure, we could plug a USB CD in there and it'd probably work fine. So how would we get these Amiga OS ROMs and ADF files over to our Pi? Easy peasy lemon squeezy flash drive. Plug it into your PC. Use the files that are on the CD that comes with Amiga OS 3.2. Copy them to a flash drive. You'll be fine. Now that the flash drive is installed here, you see I've got my, my XFER folder here with my ADFs and my ROMs in it. Basically, just maybe copy those over to your documents folder, drag and drop them to documents like I did here. Now, I also created a folder called Kickstarts and a directory called Work that we're going to talk about in just a minute. This is just a nice way to get the files over to your Raspberry Pi. Now that we have that downloaded, let's launch our software again, our Amy Berry. And you can see 
that it is similar to WinUAE, but it's not quite as fleshed out and as, as a, and, and it's not quite as fleshed out or expansive. But let's create our perfect little Amiga here. Here's some about information with all the guys. And here's where we can save our configurations. But let's build one. Let's stick with a 68040. We can have a choice of making it more compatible, which means it would run about the speed of a real 68040. Or we can use just-in-time uh, protocols, which means it will run as fast as the Raspberry Pi can handle it. It does reduce some of the compatibility, but luckily you can go and change this literally anytime you want to. Under chipset here, we're going to go with uh, AGA. Because AGA is incredible, right boat? And if you want, you can set this to an absolutely superior NTSC machine or the inferior PAL machines by remo removing that check mark. I'm going to keep this as a PAL machine for some of the things we're going to be doing with it in a while. For Kickstart Extras, you can change that to Amiga 1200 simply because then it's going to try and use some of the like emulate the IDE controller and some of the other features of the Amiga 1200. Collision level, blitter, leave those where they're at unless you have a reason to change them. Now here under ROM is where we tell it what ROM file to use, of course. And unlike Amiga Forever, we can literally tell it whatever ROM we want to. So we can go in here into Documents, we can go to Kickstarts, and see there's a A4000 ROM, A3000, A1200. All of these are my uh, ROMs that I use for my different Amigas. We can choose Amiga 1200 ROM, that happens to be the 3.2. Now here under RAM, we can go a little crazy. It's got a slider here that lets us change our chip memory and go all the way up to eight megs. Now, Amiga can theoretically support eight megs of chip memory. It's just a real Amiga has no physical way of addressing it. But our virtual Amigas, they can address it just fine. You can also add Z2 fast RAM up to eight megs, but notice how that takes your chip RAM down when you try to emulate Z2. So we're going to do Z3 fast RAM, 03 fast RAM. Here you can go from zero up to a gigabyte. Now there's a point of diminishing return on an Amiga, and I find 128 megs is a sweet spot. Uh, if I'm doing some huge graphic files, I could easily pump this up higher. You can also do motherboard slot RAM and 03 processor board type RAM here. Floppy drives. This is where we can tell our Amiga to use a floppy disk. Now, I've already moved over all of the Amiga boot floppies, so I'm going to tell it I'm going to use this install 3.2 as DF0, and we'll do workbench as 3.2. <coughs> this will come in handy when we do the actual install. Now, this is fun here, where you can adjust floppy drive emulation speed from 100% up to 800%. Now, some things, mostly games, are not gonna work if you crank up the speed of the virtual floppy. But we're gonna check and see if it works with the install. That should make it go quicker. Now, under hard drive here, this is very important. We can create a hard file, or we can bring over a hard file that we created in something like WinUAE, and it will probably work just fine. But in this case, we're going to create one. We're going to put it in a different directory here. Let's go back a little. Let's go to HDF and let's call this Amigathon. That's the file name we're going to use. And we're going to t give it a size. Now, this being Amiga OS 3.2, we could create a 128 gig hard file if we wanted to, but we don't particularly need to. Let's create a two gigabyte hard file. That should be just fine, 2000 megabytes. Now here's another cool feature, add directory. 
this allows you to use a virtual disk. We don't need that to be bootable. We'll remove that and give it a path, an actual folder path that you can use as a directory, as a hard drive. We're going to go into documents. Now I already have one called work and you see I've got a bunch of stuff already in there. So I'm going to just use this folder called work and Amy Berry is going to see that as an actual DH1 hard drive that is dynamically sizable. It will grow to whatever size it needs to be. Cool little feature and an easy way to transfer information from the Raspberry Pi side into the Amiga side. Drop the files, the LH files, LHA files into the work folder, whatever you create, the Amiga will just see them. It's cool. Now this is cool here. Add a CD drive. Okay, that means we could use an ISO file, including the ISO file that you can create from your Amiga OS 3.2 disk. So we could probably boot right to that particular ISO if we wanted to. We're not going to do it in this case. Now RTG, you may think you don't need to use RTG, real or retargetable graphics, but believe me, you do. 4 megabyte for your uh, retargetable graphics is probably fine. We're going to get back to this in a minute. Hardware information we don't care about. Full screen, 1920 by 1080. That's the screen it's going to open on. If you have a monitor that doesn't support those resolutions, you can use a smaller screen. These basically reflect how much overscan you can use. Uh, I just set them out to the max and you're just fine. Centering will try and center ECS or AGA screens. Line mode, this will add ugly, stupid scan lines. I don't know why anyone wants their machine to look like a CRT monitor. When we go into double here, this will help deinterlace the displays. Your mileage will vary on whether or not it actually works, but it does work for the most part. Under sound here, the defaults are usually fine. Enabled, most accurate, Paula volume, stereo, stereo separation. All these are just fine here. You can change your filters to emulated Amiga 1200. Now here, sound buffer size. If you have audio issues, like your, your games don't sound quite right or the audio is not quite syncing up with your games, you can adjust this sound buffer. It defaults to about eight and you'd think a bigger buffer is better. But if you have sound issues, I've found, and you can find on their readme files, that if you reduce the sound buffer, that actually improves synchronization substantially. Under input here, of course, we're using a mouse here. This is the important part, is joystick input. Now, I happen to use an awesome Logitech F710 gamepad, which is a wireless gaming pad. You see, it recognizes it immediately. It will probably recognize just about any USB joystick you put in there. Not all of them, but most. You can turn on auto fire right here, which is great for some games here. You can also emulate up to three other joysticks, a total of four joysticks if you wanted to swap out your mouse. So games like uh, Gauntlet, which you can do four player, you can actually set up right here if you have four joysticks. Under custom controls, this is really handy here. Here's our joystick one. You can control shoulder buttons, D-pads, and make them act like key presses or joypad presses so you can customize your joystick to um, you know be a function key be control alt whatever uh, which is great for things again like gauntlet where you, one player hits the space bar the other hits left alt the other hits right alt in order to use the potions just set it to a, a d-pad uh, direction on here and you are golden under miscellaneous really the only one that's important well we can synchronize the clock is setting up and making sure BSD socket library is selected. This gives network connectivity to the Amiga side and allows you to run things like eyebrows and other internet programs without having to load Roadshow. Here uh, you can control some of the, uh, the screen mappings, how you control the screen, how you quit, uh, 
this it doesn't work. Minimize, you'd think you could minimize the Amiga and get back to the Pi desktop. It just doesn't work for me. Now, when we've completed our configuration, we can go ahead and click on configurations and we're going to give it a name. We're going to call this Amigathon and we're going to save it. All right. Now, we do know that we've got our floppy drive without set to our install 3.2 right here. So we're ready to do a 3.2 install. Click the start button and it'll boot to the virtual floppy. And look at that. We've already got Workbench loaded up here off of our virtual floppy. From here, you can see we've got eight megabytes of chip mem and 128 megabytes of fast memory. We can just go to install here but look, there's our DH0 drive. This is going to be the virtual hard drive file, two mega or two gigabyte that we created. We can right click it and we can just format it like we would do any disk. We're going to call this workbench and we're going to fast file system and support long file names. We don't need a trash can. We'll do a quick format and away she goes. Boom, done. All right, now we have a blank workbench disk. Let's get installing. We're gonna to go to install. We're gonna do English. And going at 800% floppy speed, it's actually going pretty darn quick here. Let's take a look. Install release 3.2, intermediate. Yes, we wanna install it there. We want it English. Install the printers. We don't need the key mappings, so it won't bother us for any of the other locale disks. Perfect. Glow icons, yes. So now it's going ahead and it's already seen the workbench disk because I, I mapped that as a disk. When it asks for the next disk, all I have to do is insert the next virtual ADF and we will be cranking away. Amiga Disk Doctor. Now, to add the next disk, function F12. Now, F12, if you look at the Raspberry Pi 400 keyboard, is actually the F2 key. You hit function F2, it acts like F12. Now, we go here and we change it to our Disk Doctor disk and resume, and it automatically will see the disk and go on. Yay. Okay, so it's all loaded. Now this is telling us because we're emulating a 68040, it's going to require a specific CPU library in order for this to work. Now 3.2 actually comes with a reasonable library. It's telling us that we need to reboot to our install floppy and then run the installer for those libraries. So we're going to install 3.2 as the DF0 and we're going to resume and we're going to proceed and we can reboot on the Pi 400 with right control then the Pi key and then left control and that will send it the Amiga Amiga control signal and those can be modified too. Now in this case we've got Workbench installed but we want to install those MMU libraries so we're just going to install the uh, libraries using the installer disk real quick here. Yay, look at that. Now get rid of this horrible Amiga backdrop. Why they do that, I have no idea. Let's snapshot all. Now we've got a fully functional workbench on here. And look at this, that work drive I was telling you about, it sees it just as an actual disk a 47 gig disk because that's how much space I have free on my SD card and 11 gigabytes in use. You see, I've already put a few files and utilities on here, um, just things that are convenient to use. I just downloaded those uh, from the Raspberry Pi side, dropped those into the, say, the downloads folder of my work folder, and then when you boot up, all your stuff is right there. It's really, really handy. 
AGA graphics on here are absolutely beautiful. And if you wanted to, you could stick with a standard screen mode here. We're using a PAL. You can go to 256 color screen mode and you're just fine using ECS graphics. But we've got these nice retargetable graphics on here. So let's get them set up. Now, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to download Picasso 96. Now you can get that in old version from AmyNet. Uh, here it is right here, Picasso 96 LHA. I decompressed it uh, into Picasso 96 install. Or you can download it from iComp.day, who is the current owner. Jens is the current owner of it, and it's like seven or ten dollars. It's worth it. Now, when you run the setup program, uh, system friendly environment, first install, proceed with install. It's going to ask you what graphics card you want to use. And it does not matter one single bit because we're going to be using UAE graphics as you're going to see in a minute. So I'm going to tell it Picasso 2 because we need it to install a driver file into the devs monitors folder. Doesn't matter what it is. Is this lives? That's great. All the defaults here should work fine. Now, while you could reboot now, you're not going to see any extra graphics modes until you make one very simple little change here. We're going to go to the workbench folder. We're going to go to devs. We're going to go to monitors. Now see where this says Picasso 2 here? We don't have a Picasso 2 in here. We're using UAG, UAEGFX. So all we have to do is click it, go into information, and we're going to tell it board type equals UAEGFX, okay? Because UAE has its own virtual driver that's loaded automatically. Then we just rename the Picasso 2 driver Literally, right click and rename. Guess what we name it? UAE GFX. Done. Now, when we reboot, we should have some new graphics modes available. Okay, we've rebooted. We're going to go into workbench. We're going to go into prefs. We're going to go screen modes and look at these new graphics modes we have. I like personally. 1280 by 720 in 16 million colors. Click save. Boom, look at that. Just like that, we have a 24 bit 1280 by 720 workbench that will work with many, many, many productivity programs. Really sweet, and it takes like five minutes to set it up. Now let's take a look at a few real world examples here. We're going to go into work, utilities, ubiquitous sysinfo. Now notice when I click sysinfo, there is no switching of monitors. There's no flipping a switch to get it to go between retargetable graphics and ECS mode. It just displays it, which is one of the best things about Amiga emulation is it will swap between modes without any issues at all. Look at memory here. We've got our 128 megs of regular memory and two megabytes, or sorry, eight megabytes of chip. Uh, we're gonna click on speed and see how zippity doo dah day this little unit is right here. Okay. 625 MIPS, 232 megaflops. 598,868 dry stones and really fast chip memory speed. I would say that's a pretty fast Amiga. Really, really, really fast Amiga. Now, this is deceptive here. If we click on drives and we try and dr test the drive speed, you know, is it really 262 megabytes per second? 
I don't think so. But it's probably using some kind of cache to read that. So that may not be accurate. But these are fairly real world numbers and the system feels incredibly fast. When you're zipping around in here and opening things up and doing stuff, it is just blazingly fast. E easily as fast as a modern machine for day to day moving things around. Now that we've installed Amigo S 3.2, we can do things like uh, use the scroll button. I'm using the scroll button on my uh, wireless mouse and scrolling works absolutely perfect in here, which is delightful. You can even set it, of course, like I've shown you in some of my other videos, you can set some of the uh, enhanced features under eye control, move off screen. Not fond of resizable from all sizes, from all sides. I've run into some issues with that, but moving things off screen, now all of our windows can just move off screen just like that. Isn't that cool? Now let's reboot, but this time we're going to boot into one of my finished installations so we can play around a little bit. And it comes up with one of my pretty pictures that I took and brought over to the Amiga. Now this is also an Amiga OS 3.2 installation. I've just loaded some software on this one already so we can play around with it a little bit. Now, uh, let's take a look. I've loaded eyebrows on here. You're going to need to load uh, eyebrows and purchase that if you want to. And uh, Amy SSL, the latest one I think is 4.5 or 4.6. But let's see how the internet works on a fast machine like this. So we've got eyebrows up and running. Let's go to AmyNet. I would say that's pretty quick. So we'll search for something on AmyNet here. Let's search for 10 mark. And we find up to episode seven that I converted into MPEG files before I gave up because they got too darn big. Now going to modern websites is not going to work quite as well because it is an Amiga after all. Amigathon.com. Let's see how the Amigathon website looks under eyebrows. Okay, that took like two or three minutes to load everything up, but look at that. It actually loaded Amigathon 2021. Look at that, 10 mark, 7 p.m. There's a couple of Rainbow Islands. Hoffman, yep, absolutely works. Don't use this to browse modern websites. Use this to do things that Amiga is good for, like going to nice text-based websites. Or in this case, you can use it to FTP into your own personal FTP site. 1.102. You can't know my secret password for my FTP site. And it goes right to my FTP site, right on my PC. And I could go in here and, uh, you know, download pictures. There's uh, Agua Caliente. There's some Agua Caliente pictures. And it literally just will bring a picture right up from my FTP site. Or I could also download files right from my FTP site. No problems at all. Pretty cool, huh? You can also use this to download files. Like in my case, I keep a lot of files on my um, FTP site. So we could go in and uh, download the dpaint3 uh, zip files onto there. And ask you where to save it. Save it wherever you want to. Work. Downloads and I can transfer over Deluxe Paint 3 that took like two seconds. Now, one of the greatest things, like I'd mentioned, is the ability to switch between graphics modes with no issues at all. So if we go into Personal Paint here and we launch it up, we're able to go in and uh, choose a screen mode. Let's see, we'll, and we can choose any screen mode we want to. Let's see, image format, let's go and we can change into any screen mode we want to. Uh, 256 color, 320 by 200 here, and you can see it's blazingly fast. The 
gadgets to switch back and forth between screens work just fine and you cannot drag down and see an, an RTG screen. But if I had a couple of ECS screens open, I'd be able to switch between them very easily. Load times are actually pretty good. Let's load up Clown Pick here. And there's Mr. Clown. Yay. Now audio works fine for the most part too. Um, there's a couple things to be aware of. A couple of times I was playing some games and the audio just did not seem to quite synchronize with the video. So I went into the Amy Berry settings that I showed you earlier, reduced the sound buffer from eight down to one. Those audio problems went away. Don't know why, hopefully they can fix that. Now the Paula audio is emulated just fine. We're gonna play a mod file here in a second. You'll hear that it sounds just fine. Now the Pi 400 does not have an audio jack. It does not have a 3.5 millimeter jack like some of the other Pies have. All of the audio is pumped out of the HDMI cable. Now, it's going to cause a problem if like what I have here, this is just an HDMI monitor. This has no audio on it, so it's not going to play. All is not lost because for about 15 or 20 bucks on Amazon, you can pick up an HDMI to audio splitter. And it literally, you just plug the HDMI in and it goes through a little box and then you've got HDMI out and an audio out. And you can pump it to whatever speakers or device that you want to. Now, a lot of us use these SCART to HDMI converters with our Amigas. We have an RGB to HDMI cable and we can display them on our monitors. One thing you may not have been aware of is these little guys also have an HDMI input. You can plug your HDMI cable from your Raspberry Pi 400 right in this thing you may already own, pump the HDMI out right here, and look, it's got an audio out jack. Works fine. It's a splitter that you may already own, and you can just split it right off into whatever audio device you want to. Now let's crank up a little hippo player here and we're going to add a file. Sounds familiar, huh? Wonder where that's from. This is one of Mike Richmond's works here. Paula audio sounds just fine. Haven't run into any real problems. Now I'd already mentioned that I use this Logitech joystick. That's a 740, I believe. 710, F710. Works absolutely fine on my PCs. Works absolutely fine on my Pi 400. Works great for the Amiga 2. 100% wireless, little USB dongle. Let's take a look at a few games, and see how they work. Now, one of my all time favorite games is Saint Dragon. I just, I don't know something about it. That's just one of the greatest games that I've played on the Amiga. I go back to it time and again. So let's see what it looks like on the Pi 400. Now I did have issues with this game on the Pi Storm where the audio wasn't working right and the, the graphics just would start stuttering up a storm. Let's see how it performs on this. Let's give it a go. This is just such a fantastic game. Plays great even on a Amiga 500 with a meg of RAM. Just a beautiful game, and it is so fast and so fluid. And playing it with an actual controller, it's just a, a whole new world. Great scrolling on here too. Come on, oh, oh yeah. Thought you were getting away. You ain't. These little beasties are so horrible. The ones that crawl down at the bottom of the screen and then shoot you from behind. Ugh. Oh, oh yeah, that was smooth, Doug. One of the other cool things I love about this game is that when you've upgraded your weapons and then you die, not, not me because I never die in video games, but if perchance you did die, it only takes away like one level of your weapons and does not start you back at the beginning. And I think that is a really, really, really nice feature. Now, Reshoot R here. This is one that Kevin Saunders had a hand in. 
doing the uh, graphics for. This is one of the most beautiful games on the Amiga. This is AGA only. You need two megs of chip RAM and uh, it uses every last drop of it. So when you go in with something like this with eight megs of chip RAM, it really does a nice job of supporting it. This is one of the games that Amiga Bill can play from start to finish. Uh, <laughs> not me, I still have not beat the game, but it is absolutely wonderful. And the, the upgrade path is great. Some of the upgrades will speed your ship up and then the other ones will give you enhanced weapons. And there are no lives in this game. Once you die, you die. But each time you get hit, it just takes away one of your upgrades that you have. So if you've got a couple of uh, speed updates and a couple of uh, weapon power updates, you can take a couple of hits without dying. And this works really, really well on the, uh, on the Raspberry Pi. Plays great on my Amiga 1200 too, really. What? Come here, you sassy eyeballs. I'm really looking forward to the new game, um, Boss Machine, that they're working on. I know it's delayed a little bit, but uh, hopefully in the next year it'll be out. I don't know if it's quite a part two of this game, but I know that there's some kind of relationship. Aaron traveled seeking wisdom. Suddenly, attack. Foolish human, die in my soulless mists of misery. Eh, okay. The ability to switch the graphics modes on the fly is one of my favorite things about using an emulator. It just works really well. And the ability to support any kind of chipset we want to, fantastic really. This is great because of the shape of the machine. The little wedge shape of our little, little pie here is just adorable. It's so much smaller than a, a laptop or something that you might use WinUAE on. Plug it into any HDMI source, take it with you on a trip. It's small enough and easy enough to be ported around with you almost any place. Take it to a hotel, hook it up to their HDMI and their TV. You're in Amiga paradise right there. Performance is excellent. I haven't even mentioned the fact yet that you can overclock this from 1.8 gigahertz up to about 2.2 gigahertz and it still stays fairly cool. It's got some nice cooling inside there. Now, I think I only have mine overclocked to maybe 1.9 or 2 gigahertz, but I could crank it up even a little bit more and get a little bit more performance out of the beast. If I had any complaints about it, I would say it's the lack of dedicated audio jacks. I like to be able to hook up my equipment to my uh, stereo equipment if I want to, to um, you know my inputs for my uh, my uh, mic switchers, everything like that. It's nice to be able to do that without having to use a separate piece of hardware to extract out the audio. It's not a big deal, not the end of the world. And I understand if you got a TV with a sound bar or something like that, it works fine. But it'd be nice, you know, I, I'd even sacrifice the ethernet port and just stick with Wi-Fi if we just put an audio port in there. The keyboard works fine. It's not the best keyboard in the world, but it certainly is functional. You don't want to type a war and peace on there, but it's fine for day-to-day -day use, no big deal. Now I do have some issues with the Pi OS itself. For the life of me, I can't get a shortcut to work for Amy Berry. I happen to have it in my downloads folder just because that's where I decompressed it. Launch it from there, launch is fine. Make a shortcut to it, move that shortcut anyplace else in the machine, doesn't care, doesn't launch it. It's annoying. I mean, come on, this is 2021. I can make, I can click on leave out on my Amiga from 1991 and it leaves a flipping icon out that I can click and it'll run from anywhere. Just let me do the same thing here. There also seems to be no convenient way to switch from the beautiful Amiga OS that I have up and running here back over to the Pi OS. So let's say I was here and I wanted to watch a quick video, maybe a 10 minute Amiga retrocast video or something. You, you can't just minimize this screen and say, hey, there's my Chromium web browser, let's go. There are options from within Amy Berry to minimize the screen. But as soon as I do that, I get the cursor 
for the Linux screen. I can see that it's interacting with Linux, but the Amiga screen stays up and I can't see anything. And then I can't switch back. Have we never heard of like alt tab or anything in Linux? I, maybe I'm doing something wrong and please correct me if I'm wrong. After using this for a while and getting used to its little quirks and features, I am not 100% sure that this is not just about as useful and functional as a vampire standalone. I mean, seriously, it's really, really fast. It emulates things pretty good. It's got lots of chip RAM. It's got lots of fast RAM, fast hard drive. Um, maybe the Vampire V4 does something that this one does not. But one thing this does have is an absolute cool look. I'm not fond of those little blocky computers. They just look silly to me. So like the misters, which are beautiful. I love the misters, but the shape of them, the little squares, the shape of the vampire V4 be better if it was like in a standard, like an, a mini ITX motherboard that could fit into another case and just have some little cute case around it. it needs some charm. It's an Amiga. It needs charm. And of course the Pi uh, operating system and the Raspberry Pi in general is awesome because it can emulate just about anything. If I want to load MAME on here and play arcade games, whatever, fine. I want to load uh, an Atari 2600 emulator and an NES emulator and a ColecoVision emulator, fine. They all work great. I can have them running on this machine without any problem. Um, so that's a perk. That's a benefit right there. If you're looking for a good all-around retro emulator that just happens to run the Amiga OS beautifully, the Pi 400 may be the little guy for you. Huge, huge thanks to my patrons who you see scrolling down the screen right now. You guys are awesome. Thanks for all of your support. I appreciate every single one of you. If you'd like to join in and become a patron of my channel, pop on over to patreon.com forward slash 10 mark as little as two bucks a month, you can join in the fun. And I've got some cool Patreon perks that are gonna be coming your way quite soon. Thanks for joining me today. I really, really appreciate it. Don't forget the Amiga Art Contest is in full swing. Uh, this year we're doing hand-drawn art, we're doing 3D art, we're doing animations, we're doing photo editing, and we're doing music and mod files or MIDI files too. I'm already getting some absolutely fantastic submissions. Gorgeous this year, absolutely gorgeous. You guys are gonna be so impressed. The contest is going on through October 11th. You're able to submit all any of your original Amiga artwork to art at amigaartwork.com. No, my name's not Art. No, my name's not Mark. My name's Doug, D-O-U-G, Doug, thanks. But be sure to join the contest. I don't, it doesn't matter what your skill level is. Come on down, have some fun. We've got some great prizes. Please check out my channel. Like and subscribe if you haven't done it already. But until next time, this is Doug from 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast signing out to go watch the rest of Amigathon.